I say good evening to you, Kiriel. Thank you for taking the time to teach today. Over to you. Thanks very much, Sharon. Um, and before I get underway, I would like to um, start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the country in which we are all in. Um, in this case, in my case, it's the Ngunnawal country of um, the Ngunnawal people. And I'd like to say a short um, acknowledgement of country in Ngunnawal language. Dara Nura, Dara Ngunnawal. Nangu Gulanyin Nalawiri Dunai, Ngunnawal Dara. Wangarali Jinyin Maran Marlan Baran Bugarabang. Sorry for my mispronunciation. That translates as this is Nguna, this is Ngunawal country. You are we are meeting here together on Ngunawal country. We um, pay our respects to the elders. So thank you for that. And I would also like to start by acknowledging also um, the work of Robin Carol Mann, or Mann Carol, no, Carol Mann who did the translation of the uh, Libro, Libro de Gushados, which is what I'm using to do this recipe today. Um, without her work and the other work of people like her who do translations into uh, um, English from other languages, we would be truly lost today and I would not be able to do this wonderful class. So getting underway, I'm really glad that you could join me today. I'm really excited to cook this dish with you. It's my first time trying to do a live online cooking demonstration and I know most of the classes have filmed their their films beforehand but I thought no it's great to be able to cook with you today. We've shared the recipe with you in the basically the, the, the translation of the recipe and it's that that I'm going to be using. I'm going to work through various parts of the recipe with you. I've got my mortar and pestle here for mixing up my sourcing sauce and I've got my stove going with multiple things on it and those will come clear. I, I want to talk as we go about some of the ingredients um, and my choices in thing of, of ingredients and spices and things like that. Um, Mistress Juana is also with us and she has kindly uh, uh, agreed to stay with us today to answer more in-depth questions about Spanish cooking in particular. My particular expertise is in fact in medieval French cookery, so I don't feel like I'm, I have done the in-depth research that would enable me, me to answer all your questions, but I'm still very happy to answer what I can and I know Juana will be very able, ably um, covering those that I don't and so thank you very much also Juana and thank you to my lovely facilitator. So. I'm going to go through the recipe um, step by step. However, I have done some pre-preparation of some of the parts of the recipe due to the fact that we have such a limited time today. So the recipe says, take a hen which is more than half cooked and cut it up, cut it up as if to make portions. So I'll turn the camera now and so you can see over here my stove. And, in the, uh, and if you have problems, somebody tell me because um, I can't tell what you can see. Uh, and so here we have some, cook, some chicken which I have been cooking in stock and I've cooked that for about 15 to 20 minutes because you want it to be more than half cooked and it is a, a very, uh, chicken was and, and dishes like this were very much cooked in a stock or water before being roasted or in this case fried so that's why that's been done there and because of course it took 15 minutes that's why I haven't done it here. And then it says and take good bacon which is fatty and gently fry it with a bit of onion. So I've chopped up some bacon here and I will talk to you a little bit about bacon options because this specifically says bacon which is a little fatty and um, as such it can be a challenge in fact to find fatty bacon because the world is so health obsessed that most of the bacon, uh, the, at least in, in, the, in here in Australia, is has all of it is very lean it doesn't have very much bacon fat on it so I had to actually do a bit of searching to find it now I'm going to disappear to my fridge for a moment and what I found was a butcher that does for their own baking and they call this smokehouse bacon and you can see it's got a lovely thick layer of fat on it and so that's what I've used and what I actually did was oh, just, yeah. just interrupting Oh, it's sure. all right. Wana has it under control. I shall carry on. Okay. Thank you. And um, uh, so I, I, I actually pre um, took took the fat off and actually put that in the pan on a really low heat to actually 
tease the fat out of the the bake the, the kind of edge fat of the bacon to get myself some bacon fat and i've used some of that bacon fat in my second pan here which is going to i'm going to be using to fry the livers Another option for bacon um, is, uh, and probably closest to, closer to the original in some ways, is this. And this is kind of a lump of speck. And if you can think of it as like bacon, which just hasn't been sliced up for you, often that has a good amount of fat in it compared to the, the kind of more modern bacon mix. So that's the, that's the bacon I chose. And as you can probably see, I haven't fried the onion and the bacon until they're crispy or anything like that. And that's because they, these are going to get a bit more of a fry when I fry the chickens. So as the recipe says, it says, take good bacon, which is fatty, and gently fry it with a bit of onion, then gently fry the cut up hen with it. So I'm just going to bring that up to temp temperature, and I'm going to take the chicken out and pop it into the pan to fry it off. So this gives you some lovely crispy brown edges. I'm just getting that up to temperature. And it says, and take toasted almonds and grind them and mix them with quinces of pears, which have been conserved in honey. So I'll turn this back here for a moment. And I want to talk to you a little bit about grinding and, um, and uh, how to get your, uh, your almonds. I toasted my almonds. Uh, you can, uh, in the handout, I'll show you, there's a sort of page on the almonds, which explains how to peel almonds if you buy almonds which are in the kind of natural state. Um, I just toasted them in a pan and I've ground them up in with the mortar and pestle. Now the grinding is one of the things I'm really keen to talk to you about. If you need to, at a pinch, totally use um, a, a grinder. But I want to show you the difference in what you get from a grinder as to a, as opposed to a mortar and pestle. So last night I ground um, some of the almond meal in uh, almond into uh, into this with using a bar mix. I don't know what what other names you call it. A stick stick blender to get a really fine grind. But you can see that it it st has stayed as a powdery kind of form, even though it's quite finely ground. I then also, and I'm going to have to get a teaspoon for this, ground some almonds with the mortar and pestle. And, you know, actually it took it for about the same amount of time. And as you can see, it's quite a thick paste of almonds. You get quite a different consistency from it and you get a different flavor because it brings out the flavor in the almonds. Now, um, and the same goes for spices. If you're using spices, it's worth experimenting, trying to grind the spices by hand just to see how different it is if you then need to use a spice grinder, do, but just do it knowing that there is a difference in, in what outcomes you're going to get from it. And I just have to pop my chicken in the pan. Right. Popping my chicken into the pan. So I'm just going to let that fry. In the other there we go, I'll turn that a bit. In the other fry pan I have here, I'm going to just fry my um, livers. Now the recipe doesn't sort of say exactly how much livers, except it says take the livers of the hens. So the way I kind of work this and the, and the way I would recommend is that basically for one chicken's worth of meat, you need one liver. It's not very much, and if you're like me, you might have a challenge finding livers in that smaller quantity. If that's the case, don't worry about it. Take the, 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 the pack that they, that they have for you. In my case, it was a half kilo minimum. And uh, fry them off as well and use them to make a beautiful pate. So here is my lovely um, liver, which I've now got. Just going to add that to the pan. Now, the original uh, instruction says in fact to um to take the livers of the hens and roast them on the coals so in the in the domestic kitchen of course that's very awkward and difficult to do so i'm um, i tried in um grilling them to see what whether that would be an acceptable uh way of going but i found that it, it wasn't all that did was really dry them out and it didn't much um go, go through the the, the um, livers well and um, cook them before they were actually kind of just rubbery and tough. 
So I'm got what I've gone for here in the domestic kitchen is I'm cooking them in a bit of the extra bacon fat which I set aside and drained off um, earlier. So I'm just frying that bacon, it's going to get very noisy here. Maybe I should move it to the further away pan. So it's a funny spot, but it's not quite so noisy in the microphone. So I'm just frying my livers. As you can see, I'm frying my chicken. And I'm working it now, and you don't have to worry too much about, the, about the, how long you fry them for because the chicken has already been mostly cooked. Um, this is really just the browning process, and I, I then in the end, end, end up simmering it a bit in the, in the, in the sauce in, at the end as well. So it gets a bit of extra cooking. So in the meantime, it says take your toasted almonds and grind them and mix them with quince or pears which have been conserved in honey. So here's my almonds. I've pre ground them so that it's not too noisy. Um, because it is pretty noisy business using that, that mortar and pestle. And I wanted to talk to you about, uh, again, in the handout, I have a picture of a quince because you may not have seen a quince anywhere before. And what I've got here is I can show you, this is a quince paste that a friend of mine um, made at home. And it's essentially like a dark kind of maroon color, and very solid block. And if you have homemade quince paste or commercial quince paste, it will look pretty much like this. Um, I also did a bit of an experiment uh, and worked on this to do this recipe rather than using a commercial or my friend's quince paste. I actually made my own quince kind of conserve because it, it actually says, you know, that they are uh, conserved in honey. And I think the taste difference is quite different from uh, the, the modern quince pastes, which are quince pastes, which are mostly made with sugar. So I did my own in honey and basically I got the quinces, chopped them up, covered them in water, added honey to sweeten them and just kind of boiled it down. It only takes a short while to get to, to the, the um, quinces actually break down. And as you can see, it's got some solidity to it. You can see that it's keeping the surface um, shape, but it's not as solid as that quince paste. But it works perfectly well for this recipe, especially because the recipe is in, is ending up using and creating a sauce. I'm just going to check on my frying pan. But if it's a time of year or you live in a place where you can't get quinces, quince paste. I mean, that's right. I totally, totally think you should, you know, use quince paste if, if you haven't got anything else. I've used quince paste the first couple of times I've used this recipe and would use it again any time. Um, I do want to make this make sure you, sure you know that this is actually really accessible and easy to make. Um, I'm just showing you the slightly more hard work way because that's my thing. <laughs> but I also want to show you that it's actually not that much hard work. So anyway, I'm adding my um, quinces and I'm adding a reasonable amount here because I think that the quince paste adds a lot to the flavour of it. Now Sharon, you might want to, to mute me for just a second because I'll just do a bit of enthusiastic grinding here and it might be a bit noisy. Sorry, Kirielle, um, the most I can do is send you a message to say, please unmute now. So you're going to have to push a button. You're muted. Kirielle, you're muted. Kirielle. You're muted. We can't hear you. <laughs> you can't unmute yourself. Well, that's... Well, I can, all I can do is say, ask Kirielle to unmute, which I've done. Yeah, you might need to press the button, love. All right. <laughs> All right. So let's not do that again because that's awkward. <laughs> and I think you'll have to just listen, 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 to put up with the sound of my grinding. Because um, yes, I'm because I, I of course can't see the phone because I'm got the phone on camera. Anyway, we're at the point now where I've ground the 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 mix of the quince paste or, or the quince and, and honey and the almonds, and now I'm adding. The liver. Okay. 
I've turned off my chicken because it's uh, it's kind of browned. Squint. And I'm now going to grind again. Apologies for the grinding noise. The wonderful one of the wonderful things about this sauce is the colour, and you end up with this gorgeous pink sauce. If you use commercial quince paste, it will in fact be darker red. And I have done this recipe without the livers. So if you know you've got people who are super feeling super fussy and they just don't want to know about livers, then you can do it without it, and it and, and it just becomes a lovely rich kind of ruby red colour. So I've got to include our livers in this one because they are rather lovely and as long as you don't mind a kind of pate-ish edge to your dish, they are very, very delicious. And then it says, and take a crustless piece of bread toasted and soaked in white vinegar and grind that in the mortar with the other stuff. So I've got a bit of going, it's still not entirely smooth, but I'm not going to worry too deeply about it because it's going to be pushed through a sieve anyway. So over here I've got a piece of panna di casa, which has um, it says specifically take the crust off, so I've taken the crust off, it's been toasted, and it's been soaked in the vinegar. Ariel, uh, have you ever uh, done this with the pears instead of quince? I haven't done it with the pears, though I think it would, I think, you know, the pears would still be delicious, but I love the, the colour that quinces get, and you won't get the same kind of colour from a pear dish. It will be much lighter. And um, if you did, did the quince, then it's prob probably worth um, using the spice mix with the saffron in it. I'll, I'll get on to that a little later. So our crustless piece of bread here is, as you can see, very, very soggy. I've soaked it in white vinegar, and now I'm going to add that to our mortar as well. There we go. It's a pretty messy looking thing, isn't it? And do do tell me if if I if I if the camera isn't well pointed to for you being able to see. So excuse me, I'm going to make a bit of grinding again, noise again. Maybe I will get you to mute for just a second, um, and I'll unmute myself when once it's done. Um, yeah. Sharon, so that I can, I'm going so I can get really get amongst it. You can watch me really go. Definitely. Okay, go for it. Okay, that's probably enough noise. Um, it's it's not as smooth as perhaps it could be but it's not bad and again once it goes, goes through, the, through the straining it will actually hopefully be a bit smoother and the next step of the recipe is to blend it with hen's broth that is well salted now as it happens i cooked my chicken in broth so i have hen's broth here so i'm going to use some of my hen's broth and chicken and add it to my mortar. Just going to blend that a little bit gently. There we go. And uh, I found with this when I made it um, a test test run of it recently that it was I ended up adding just a little bit more chicken um, broth to it. I quite like it being thin. It goes through the strainer a little more easily, and um, because I put it back in the pan. I do want to have lots of lots of sauce because I do love a, the sauce. This can be cooked in huge quantities or small quantities. Um, you can just and you can speed all this up. Feel you know use your use your stick blender or whatever. And there we go. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? Looks a bit bit of mess. So Mum and I had a bit of a discussion about. Um, strainers and concluded that you know well that we didn't have the, the, the strainer that they might be pushing for. It's not clear from the instruction what it is. It just says and strain it all through a sieve. So I have previously strained using one of these. As you can see this kind of got a point 
and it's a sort of double um, strainer. So it's quite a fine strainer, even though it's quite tough. So you can use that. I do have sets of strainers like this, which um, are another option. That's a very, very fine though. And my concern with using that is that the push, the, the amount of pushing you might need to do through to, to be able to strain through something that fine, it might pop out. Um, so it's, it's, you know, worth considering, but it's not what I'm going to use today. And so today I'm making a, a slightly rough and more rough and ready um, version because it's um, uh, I'm using this strainer here. And so again, it's a wire strainer, but it's a, a, a bit more loose. And I'm going to see how we go going through that and see if we end up with something which has got a nice texture. Texture, and if it if I'm not happy with the texture, then I might put it through a second strain and, in, and put it through the last strain. So, this has also got the advantage of having a bit more capacity, so you can hold a bit, you can hold a bit more source. Now, the mortar is a bit much for that, so I find that a good wooden spoon is just the thing to be able to push your sauce through a strainer. See, I'm just kind of twirling it through. The strainer. And this is kind of giving it an extra grind, if you like, and from the mortar and from the what you had from the mortar and pestle. You can see that the sauce underneath there is becoming it's a kind of more consistent source and actually quite a fine source. So I'm not unhappy with the results from this strainer. Let me just pull the rest of the mixture through. Now at this point in time, the recipe says to cast it in a pot and cast the hen in also. So um, you could dirty yet another pot, but my intention is not to dirty another, yet another pot, but to actually cast the hen, uh, cast the sauce into the pan that I have uh, with the chicken already in it. As you can see, I've still got some stuff here, and I'm not plus to use a bit of extra stock to get my push through and in the handout that I've done I actually did ha have a little video on how to kind of prepare your livers if you wanted to pre-prepare your livers before frying them. In modern um, cookery when making pâtés and things like that you actually remove the connective tissue from the um, from the livers before you fry them. I haven't Worry, you don't have to worry about it much for this recipe because it all it gets ground and then it goes through the strainer. So you end up with quite a nice fine mix anyway. So now what we have is our sauce here. It's not bad. You know, it could be finer and um, I think a bit more grinding and going through the finer sieve would give it a bit more consistency of colour. But I think it's probably good for today. How much time do we have? We're actually doing really well, so maybe I will put it put put a bit of it through a, a, um, the other strainer just so we can see if there's a difference. Worth it, worth it, so that you can have a bit of a demo. And you can see immediately the difference that the finer strainer has. If you look at that, what's left in the bowl, you can see that all of the kind of, I don't know how well the, the video shows the kind of speckled surface of the, the, the source um, from that has come through the normal strainer, but once it has gone through this finer strainer, This is a lot less noisy than the grinding, isn't it? You end up with this much, much um, more consistent coloured sauce. 
It's interesting because that? with so many modern sauces, you add like a roux or something to thicken the sauce. And here we're thinning the sauce. In many ways, we are thinning the sauce or, or just taking the kind of larger matter out of the sauce and, and making it finer. Because we've added the thickeners are the almonds, the um and, the and bread. The, the bread, the livers partly, but they're really for flavor, meatiness and um, texture. You find that the, the, they add a kind of richness of mouth feel that you don't get if you don't have that. So there we go. I hope you're not, you're not getting bored watching me grinding things through strainers. So let me show you again the difference between the two. Now, can you see, is, there, is it sophisticated enough for you to be able to see the kind of difference in the kind of consistency of the two and the colouring of the fine, fineness of the particulate matter, if you'd like. Don't know that it's enough that to, to, to panic about or to, to get yourself worried about. Depends on whether you are serving this at a really high-end feast, whether you're serving this at home um, and, you know, what your care factor is. So, all we have to do now is add our sauce to our pan here, turning back to the stove a bit. I'm not sure you can see that. So. Adding our sauce back to the pan and bringing that up again. Now, if you did this with um, smaller pieces of chicken, you can do this as a kind of casserole if you like with much smaller pieces of chicken or, or almost like a, a pottage or a soup. Um, it is actually listed as a pottage um, of marinated hen called Jeanette of Hens. So it is actually, you know, um, it is actually quite you can, acceptable for it to be in, in a smaller format. But for a modern meal, I think this is a really nice way to have it with a nice piece of chicken with the sauce on top. So, there we go. And this is a good way also to, to clean your pan because um, uh, bringing the chicken up to temperature and doing a little bit of extra cooking on it will lift the pan juices here. You can see kind of in the pan little bits that stuck from the bacon. And that the simmering of this the chicken in these pieces in this sauce will lift that and help clean your pan as well. It's handy. Right, so in, in true cooking school fashion, I should have someone here, you know, being my cook, uh, my second to cook and, and bottle washer who would wipe up my bench and everything <laughs> for me as I go. Sadly, I don't. So now, now while that's yep. the facilitator say that it is now 4 30, and so you have great. 20 minutes to go still. I have heaps of time. You have heaps I was so panicked. I was so panicked that I would have not have enough time for this. So that's why I did so much of this in advance. Well, there'll be plenty of time for questions then. So I'm bringing that up to, to them. And then it says now, so which gives me an opportunity to talk a bit about spices. And it says, cast in all the spices and a good quantity of sugar. So the spices. What I have used for this particular recipe is in later in the or earlier somewhere else in the in the um the Libro de Guisados is in fact a list of some sauces and one of them is a um uh, a recipe for a common sauce and the common sauce has three parts cinnamon, two parts cloves, one part ginger, uh one part pepper uh, and coriander. So I've made that up already. Again, trying to be very organized in my mortar and pestle here. But I will take a moment to have a quick talk about the spice, some of the spices that have got into it. For this recipe, I've, uh, I have used cinnamon and I'd love to show you at this point in time the difference between cinnamon and cassia because there is a, a strong difference, although many times you will find in the shops when you buy cinnamon, it's actually cassia bark. Cinnamon, 
you can see is these very fine, hopefully you'll be able to see here, very fine, almost shaved quills of, of bark. And it's, you can see that it's very, very thin. And it is uh, softly spiced. If you taste it, you can actually um, get a piece of, of cinnamon bark and chew it as a mouth freshener. And it's actually really pleasant and a little bit sweet to the taste. Like it really, if you're hankering for something sweet, try a bit of cinnamon bark because it will freshen your breath and it's just really lovely and, and sweet. Cassia, however, is this. And as you can see, it's a lot thicker. It's heavy bark. It has a bit more bite than cinnamon. Cinnamon is quite a soft um, burn, but cassia is actually spicier, um, but it's not as sweet. And they do have actually a little bit of a different taste. So do, do try to look for proper cinnamon rather than cassia in the shops if you get the, the, the choice, depending on the recipe. If you have a recipe that needs, needs cassia, use cassia. And you will find in most medieval recipes that they actually do um, differentiate. They will um, talk about cannel, they will talk about cassia, um, they will talk about cinnamon, and they will talk about cassia separately from cinnamon. Then Curiel? Curiel? Yes. Last weekend, I learned that there are various grades of this, the true cinnamon, mm -hmm. and that the highest grade is, the, is called Alba. So uh -huh. if you have a really good spice vendor that you get your true cinnamon from, see if they have Alba because that's the primo stuff. Mm -hmm. Very good to know, good tip. Um, then um, I haven't got ginger here but because I used um, dried um, uh, ginger for this recipe. And this is the, but I did want to show you the pepper that I chose. Um, you may not be aware there's a whole pile of different peppers out there um, uh, which were in use in medieval times, some of which are slowly coming back into fashion um, in European cooking, which I'm delighted for. And this is one of those peppers. If you have a look at this pepper, hopefully I'm showing this in a way that you will see, it has like a little bit of stem on it. And this is known as, because of, the, because of that little stem, tail pepper or cubebs. So if you've always wondered with those recipes what cubebs were looked like and what they were, that's a cubeb. And I've chosen that pepper because um, it's got a lovely flavour, which is just a little bit different from, from modern pepper and is, um, uh, was around at the, in the period. And, and um, I've got a whole other class that I do on pepper. We'll talk about that some other day. <laughs> but um, I've chosen cubebs this time around, partly in, in fact to show you. As you, you can probably see, um, if I turn, turn the camera slightly, in the background there on my, in, way in the back, that is, um, yeah, this is my peppers. And as you can see, there is the grinder of her, all of the peppers in the universe. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, don't, you don't have to be a pepper snob like I am by any means and, and, and you can use whatever pep pepper you have at hand. Um, black pepper kind of came in and supplanted them all. All of the other peppers, you know, were, were being used and then they found black pepper and they went, wow, this is like hotter and spicier and all of the cool things. And they, they got trade routes through to the um, Indies and, the Ind and Indonesia, which allowed them to get black pepper in uh, inexpensively into it. To Europe and so black pepper became the, the whole the rage but uh, you may be interested to try and have an experiment with diff other different peppers. Then I've got some coriander here most of you have probably seen some uh, co coriander seeds they grind really really easily so don't be put off by getting the, the seeds rather than having pre-ground coriander it really they just crush really, really quickly in the, 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 with the mortar and pestle, and you can get this sort of spice mix. And so it says, and this sauce must be a little sour. I haven't added the spices yet, so I'll add our spi some spices. And my strong advice with all the spices is, when in doubt, put just a little, and then put more, because you can't untake the spices out of the dish. So 
I'm just going to take a little. I find, found that this one, the clove, is quite strong, but um, it depends a bit on whether you like cloves or not as to how much you wanted to use. And in my handout, I will provide that, um, that spice mix that I've used in this recipe. Turning back does, to does, the, does the recipe give proportions on the spices or is it more to the cook's taste? The, spi the recipe for the spice mix does give proportions. Okay. So it, it's, it, is, it is quite specific. It's, it, is, it doesn't tell you ounce by ounce, it tells you by parts. So it says three parts cinnamon, two parts cloves, one part ginger, one part pepper, and no, yes, no, yeah, and a little coriander. So a little coriander is the only bit which it is actually vague. So having tried a little bit of that spice, let's just see what it tastes like. Oh. Now, I really wish you could all be with me here today so you can try this because it is just incredible. You've got this lovely bacony goodness coming through the sauce. I'm, I think I'm going to be brave and add just a tiny bit more spice um, to it. You've got the, the, that sour edge, which um, the recipe specifically says, it says, and this sauce must be a little, a little sour. You've got that little sourness that came from the soaked bread. And then you've got a little bit of sweetness from the, from the quince. I think it's just divine. I actually quite like sweet, sweetish savory foods. So I'm tempted to add just a little bit more quince to this. I'm gonna add just a, a little dash more quince so I can get that honey. There we go. A little bit more honey into the mix. I know I should have strained that, but anyway. There we go. We have our delicious sauce. As you can see, the color is reasonably spectacular for, um, from the, the quince paste. And again, if you use um, quince paste rather than being the, the quinces that I've done here, you will get a really, really deeper um, red, which is really worth having. And it says, and when the sauce is cooked, cast a little finely shredded parsley and prepare your dishes. So I've got a little finely shredded parsley and it is worth adding this. I'm not actually a huge parsley fan and never have been, but having added the parsley to this dish pre previously, um, and you know, trying it without the parsley and then trying it with, the parsley just gives it, yes, yet another kind of level of sophistication in the palate that is worth doing. Does mean that your sauce ends up with green spots. <laughs> So <laughs> I think it aesthetically might not be quite as pretty as it was before I added the parsley, but the taste is great. So here we have our beautiful dish. Our chicken is should be all cooked. Let me just serve that up. There we go. Chef like we have a <laughs> our finished dish. It just says then and cast upon them cinnamon and sugar. So I've got just a little bit of cinnamon sugar here, which I'm gonna sprinkle on top just to finish it. Now I'm one of my my bugbears about medieval cooking cooking is the amount of sugar that put people people put into things. They they kind of go this had sugar in it, so therefore I need to put tablespoons or cups of sugar into my dish. Um, I think that uh, sugar was much more used, like we use salt now, in those kind of quantities. It's all that is necessary. You don't need to make dishes really sweet. You just need to, you know, have them be, um, you know, that's, you know, the sugar is serving the same purpose as salt. You know, how it, how, you know, I don't know whether you've seen the salt, salt, sweet, um, sharp. 
this dish has them all because it's got the sweetness from the quince paste in the honey. It's got the sour from the, the bread soaked in the um, vinegar and it's got the salty from that um, hen stock and from the um, bacon. So just to cut it up, you can sort of see here, lovely piece of chicken. And putting sugar on yeah. at the end is a way of showing off. That's because it. Sugar was expensive and it's like, oh, look at me, I have sugar. That's right. And now you get the joy of watching me. Mm. <laughs> there are several oh. comments in the chat that people want to come and help you eat that, Curiel. Oh, I seriously wish you could because it is just amazing. And um, I really encourage you, if, if you need to speed things up, you can, there are uh, steps you can definitely take to do that. Um, but as you can see, most of this has, has been cooked in half an hour. What you could speed up is you could use almond milk instead of using, um, grinding your almonds either um, with a stick blender or blender. And, um, uh, but I think th there's something about the almonds that also adds to it because the almonds have been toasted before they got ground and that kind of really brings out the almond flavour and brings out the almond oils, which I think you don't get if you use um, uh, almond milk, but it is a great way of doing this if you're going to do this for a large number of people. The, there are things you can do to make it for a large number of people and, and scale it up very easily. That includes doing all your, uh, doing it all, you know, essentially in, in two pots instead of, I've got three kind of going here, using the almond milk, using commercial quince paste. I've got a, a tin of quince paste here somewhere. Oh, yes, there we are. Here's one I prepared earlier. <laughs> it's uh, sold as Dulce de Membrillo and um, is a, uh, if you can find it like this rather than the tiny fancy little things that you buy to go with cheese, this is definitely the way to scale up and lasts forever in your cupboards. And it's just, and, but, but you do need to have an occasion that's going to use a lot of quince paste, although it keeps for a while once opened and taken out of the tin. And just have so more cheese. Good. Sorry, that's right, exactly. You can have some of it for, to have with cheese instead, um, uh, but it's worth doing. Uh, so that's um, essentially. Curiel, Curiel, there's a question, there's a question um, regarding almond butter you were talking about almond milk so i'm not sure whether yeah. or not the person questioning is confused oh, about the difference no no i think i think i understand what the question is could they use almond butter instead i think that's a really good question and i think you probably could because what almond butter will do it's, it instead of using is um, kind of the equivalent of peanut butter so what you're doing is is still having that kind of paste that you get from it and um, then adding your stock and things and getting all of that out of it. That's not a bad idea. It's a, it, um, it's uh, probably, if you have almond butter already in the house, it's, it's uh, I think, a very acceptable idea to, to use your almond butter for that. It might be a bit expensive for a large feast, but um, I don't know, it depends on how expensive um, almond butter is in your town. And so, read the ingredients to make sure there's not extra stuff in there besides almonds. Yeah. Not yeah. too much. So yes, this is definitely not a nut friendly dish and I don't recommend trying to make it without nuts, but but I guess you could um, instead of having, you could have, um, try using a bit of extra bread, but not more <laughs> vinegar than you get from one slice of bread. Um, uh, and, and maybe more hen stock if you had to make a nut free version. Uh, that might work. You wouldn't have quite the same luscious mouthfeel, but, but the livers give you some of that. So it probably would work too. Um, how you could do it without bacon? Well, I don't know. Why? <laughs> Why would you do it without bacon? Why would you do anything without bacon, really? Um, and one of the things I have observed about, um, uh, about 16th century uh, uh, Iberian cooking, the recipes I've come at is that there is a lot of bacon. There is a lot of in, bacon stock. Yeah, uh, on the Iberian Peninsula, bacon is a seasoning. It's that's it, and and in part, and it's, it's actually a reaction to the the uh, the Spanish the occupation expulsion. by the Moors. That's right. So yeah, and to the expulsion, to make sure that the conversions were sincere. 
Exactly. So if you wanted to make sure that the people weren't, that you're feeding weren't secret, you know, um, uh, Muslims, <laughs> then, then you would put bacon and everything. That and fatty, one of, one fatty of the lamb comments, stock. Kiriel, one of the comments is, this is because they have the tastiest piggies. <laughs> That's it, they do have very, very, very true. tasty piggies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. I, I have an entire, I live by myself and I, I bought an entire leg of, of Hamon Serrano and I've got it in the in the fridge and but I live by myself and with the COVID-19 I can't I'm not gonna you know open an entire leg this big of Hamon um otherwise I might just eat the whole thing. Now, so did you have we, we, got, we got one of those legs for um our wedding reception. Mm, nice. And, yeah. and it came with a stand and everything, so it just came Oh, uh, yeah. No, I, I got one of those, which is a smaller one. This one is a big one. I'll, I'll, you might as well see it and have a look at my fridge. Now, Kiriel, can you still hear me while you're over at the fridge? Kiriel, <laughs> this is your facilitator just to say you've got about three minutes to wrap up if there's anything you particularly want to say. Okay, well I think I've kind of covered everything. I'm happy if anyone wants to chat about any of this um, to go into the social room after this for a little while um, to, and to be open to questions because I know people will be going on to other classes. I do want to wind up by again thanking my lovely facilitator Sharon and for um, to thank also Juana for staying up so late because for her it's much much later in the day than it is for me to help answer questions and um, facilitate the, the discussion today and I'll raise a glass to you. This, this cup was made by my friend um, Alex who does medieval pottery and as you can see it's got a kind of plague doctor on it and he's battling death juggling COVID-19. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I will finish off by raising my glass to you all and hoping you all stay well and safe and have some experimentation um, in cooking while you're um, while you're in these difficult times. Um, Kiriel? Yeah. I must I must ask about the apron. It's all of Lockock as a stained glass window, isn't it? Yeah, this is from a Rowany Festival. So a Rowany Festival is one of the biggest events or the biggest event we hold in the Kingdom of Lockhart. And it's, and it's a, too much fun. A, it is. And it's about a week long um, camping event around Easter. And um, the uh, one of the artists in Lockhart makes um, both, uh, always makes a tea towel or a t-shirt or and a t-shirt is a tea towel from a previous festival. And now she started making aprons for each festival. So you can buy an apron every festival. So I had to wear that for this class for you all. Does she have any more? It's cool. Uh, I, the, the aprons tend to sell out, I'm afraid, uh, but I can ask. I can ask. Okay. Thank you. There were, some it's years there are, there are a couple of leftovers. Yeah. Any other questions from anyone? Um, I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat. I think all of the things either you covered or I answered them so that I didn't interrupt your flow. Lovely. Much. Well, and the handout is, is not very sophisticated or fancy, but it does have some of the original recipes. It has them also in the, from uh, um, pictures of the original text. So if you want to try translating yourself from the 16th century um, Catalan or Spanish, you can have a go at it if you'd like. Oh, we did have a question here from Flida. What is mm -hmm. your favorite medieval ingredient? <gasps> oh. Well, bacon is up there. <laughs> but my favourite spice is probably grains of paradise. Um, so I'm into spices. I don't know whether you can see here my spice drawer there. Um, I'm, I'm quite into spices and I just love grains of paradise. It's just the, the, mm. the flavour of it is like nothing else. Um, yeah. So that's probably, probably my favourite. And quince paste is pretty high, though, I have to say. Bacon, bacon. <laughs> oh, and now we've got somebody asking, what, what is it like? I guess what, is what grains of paradise are like, I think is what she means. It's, it's a peppery, it's a peppery thing. 
it, it's slightly peppery, but it's got a floral almost taste to it. Mm -hmm. Almost as if you're tasting perfume. Um, it's, I can show you what it looks like. I've got a little, it's in, I've got in my grinder here. Yeah, Fleeta said it's, gingery floral pepper. Yeah, it's, it's tiny little grains. It's got these tiny little grains, um, which I'm not sure whether this will be able to, you'll be able to see or not. And, um, and yeah, it's just, and it's really particularly good, I find, with eggs uh, and egg dishes. I, that's what I particularly love it for. And if you get, get the ability to have, it's also called maniguette, I think, in French. So that's, that's grains of paradise. Okay, I'm not seeing any further questions. Right. Well, lovely talking to you all. Sharon, over to you.